Ovik, good to see you. How you doing, man? Peter, it's great to be with you again, and welcome back to Austin. Yeah, we're going to do this quite regularly. Yeah, I like it. I, I'm, I'm climbing up the league table of appearances on uh, what Bitcoin did. You're doing it, man. Well, listen, there's a specific reason we wanted to come and talk to you. Um, I've just finished making my uh, second film of this Follow the Money series, and we decided to do it in the UK. We decided to cover inflation, and uh, as part of that, I was uh, traveling around Bedford where I live and covering but I also went to a place called Harlow which is quite deprived uh, and in making the film we uh, spent a lot of time speaking to people about what they understand about inflation what the impact of uh, has been on them and then since then the UK has obviously been kind of like kind of just falling into this absolute shit show this economic shit show we've had this huge increase in energy prices to the point where it's trying to understand how people can afford their energy is it's quite difficult. I mean, at one point they were predicting the energy cap. Do you know, you know about the energy cap we have in the UK? Uh, I know there's a there's a there's a cap. You tell me. I don't want to miss. Well, the, the, the energy cap is kind of like it's not exactly a cap, but it's based on the most the energy companies can charge you. There's a limitation, and that's to that just of, could yeah create shortages. It's a classic price control problem. Yeah, but but at the same time, it's it's, it's existed to make energy affordable mm -hmm. for families. And at one point. I mean, it was about £1,000 last year. Was it about 1300 Danny, I think? And then it suddenly jumped up to it was going to be about five to 6000 which means people just cannot heat their homes. And at a time when we've got high inflation, and people are struggling to make ends meet then, there, and now we've got raising interest rates, there's a lot of problems for a lot of different people. And it's not just the poorest, but the middle class are being whacked as well now. Um you know I'm obviously a fan of the work that FreeUp does. I read every single newsletter with great interest because obviously your work is trying to help. Well, you should explain what you do, but but because of what you do, we wanted to talk to you about these issues and, 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 and get an understanding of uh, how to better construct a civil um, society that kind of supports each other. So I kind of wanted to talk to you about what I've seen, talk to you about your work and try and understand how these two things meet. I've done a really bad job there. Does that make sense? No, that's that's great. And and uh, again, thank you for uh, for uh, for highlighting our work. Uh, so I run this think tank called the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity or FreeOp, F R E O P P. And our website is www.freeopfreopp.org. Or if you want to subscribe to that newsletter that Peter was mentioning, it's substack.freeop.org. So pretty easy to plug into your Substack feed. Definitely subscribe. It's brilliant. Thank you. And we, uh, and we work on how to use uh, individual liberty and economic freedom and innovation and entrepreneurship and pluralism to improve the lives of Americans. But these lessons apply throughout the West, throughout the industrialized world. How to improve the lives of Americans whose incomes or wealth are below the U.S. median. So how to increase more social mobility or how to increase social mobility, how to, uh, how to increase incomes and also reduce the cost of living because that becomes a big part of the problem that has been neglected that has bipartisan solutions. So a lot of our, a lot of why, the reason why we have that um, approach, why we are trying to use uh, free enterprise and economic freedom and individual liberty in particular and innovation in particular to improve social mobility is because it's a way to bring the parties together, to, to, to show the left and the right or left of center people and right of center that, hey, you don't have to be fighting each other all the time. There are solutions that you can both champion that can advance your values without compromising with the other side. They actually advance your own values in the way that you see them. Uh, but also bring in others that you might not otherwise work with. And that's the only way you can get things done in our system in the U.S. And at least in, in most parliamentary systems in, in Europe, one party gets control and they can at least pass a few things, particularly if they have a clear majority as opposed to a coalition. And in the U.S., that's a lot harder. Our system is designed so that you have to have the House and the Senate and the presidency, and even then you have to get 60 votes in the Senate. So even when the Democrats control Congress and the White House, as they do uh, in 2022, as we're recording this podcast, uh, Democrats can't get everything done that they want to do because they are limited by some of these uh, Madisonian restrictions in, in, in uh, majority control. So all that to say that if we want to actually address some of these structural problems that we have in the West— you're not going to be able to do it, generally speaking, by doing it through one party. You have to at least get some buy-in from the other party uh, and bring people together. And, and so that's, that's the core idea, the core or insight, I should say. And the good news is free enterprise and individual liberty and innovation and entrepreneurship do actually increase 
uh, prosperity for lower and middle income people. They've done that all over the world. We've lifted a billion people out of poverty in India and China over the last 20 years. In, uh, in the 80s, in the UK and the US, we certainly did a lot to increase economic prosperity for lower and middle income people. And we can do that again in the 90s as well. So the 80s and 90s were times in which uh, growth was highly inclusive. We didn't have the massive explosion of wealth inequality that we're seeing over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and we can obviously get into what, what's driving that wealth inequality, but one big factor, which you're alluding to with, with some of the work you're doing, is the high cost of living which isn't just about inflation in the way you read about it in the newspaper. It's a broader set of problems that means that uh, you're working harder to earn less than you did before. Or because it's not just about inflation in the sense of how much your grocery costs or how much your, your petrol, your gas bill is when you, when you fill up your tank in your car. It can be about things like if you want to own a home, how easy is it to own a home? How easy is it to educate your kids? Uh, and in the U.S., those in particular big problems, the high cost of health care here is a huge driver, right? So there, there are aspects of this problem that are driven by the way central banks behave, which in the Bitcoin community we talk about a lot. Um, we could call that the macroeconomic aspect of inflation. There's also a microeconomic aspect of inflation, which is when you make it a lot costlier to start a business or to operate a business that serves people in some important way, that business has to raise its prices in order to continue to operate. Uh, and then those prices flow down to you in the form of higher prices, higher costs of living for you. Uh, for example, in San Francisco, they're very good at saying, no, you can't build that apartment high rise. You can't build that house. You can, you know, you, if you build that house, you can only rent it to one person, not to multiple people. And when you have those kinds of rules, what happens? Uh, there's fewer housing units available. When there's scarcity, lower supply, there's higher prices if demand keeps going up, right? So those are the kinds of problems that we found to be uh, uh, a rich area for us to try to develop solutions that both parties can find interesting. And that goes across healthcare, goes across energy, housing, uh, you name it, education. We, we find that uh, there's a lot to do, and not just about what the Fed does or central banks do, but in terms of these fairly technical areas where changing a law here or changing a rule here could open up the supply uh, and, and reduce the cost of delivering an important service to the population and thereby making life more affordable for more people. And so the work you're doing is advising on policy. And in doing so, you're obviously supporting the government, supporting the state, supporting politicians, helping people to create policy whereby the money they collect either from, either from tax, which it seems to be less and less these days, or from deficit spending goes towards creating opportunities for others. Um, so in the world of Bitcoin, some people are very anti-government, anti-tax, anti-redistribution of money. Um, what arguments would you give to, you know, what, what empirical evidence do you have that doing this kind of work is good for everyone. It benefits everyone. Well, if we look throughout human history, we have lots of unequal societies. In fact, almost every society is unequal. It's just a matter of degree, right? And I would argue, I think all the evidence suggests that the least unequal societies are those where the economy is dynamic, where people can start from very little and, and grow into something more, whether it's through working hard in school and getting a, a, a good education and then getting a good job, or whether it's starting a business that ends up growing into something else, or whether it's you got, you got into Bitcoin in uh, 2011 uh, on your laptop and you were mining it and, and that was your, your, your route to success. There are lots of different ways to be successful, but societies that are more innovative, they're more dynamic, that have fewer restrictions to competing with the status quo, with the establishment, those are the societies that tend to be the most equal. To, to give an example from history, um, when the bubonic plague blew out Europe and the 50% of the population uh, got decimated by, uh, by, by the plague, um, that was one of the great democratizing uh, episodes in history because all of a sudden labor was really scarce. And so this old feudal system had to make way to a more modern system in which you actually had to say, you know what, if you want to work for me, I got to pay you more. Uh, and that then led to the prosperity of a lot of people who then had more political power as a result. So if you want a more politically equal society, if you want a more economically equal society, then you have to have a society where more people can work and grow their own earnings. And the way you do that is by having a vibrant economy where people, uh, various businesses and various employers are competing for your labor, for your services. 
I agree with you and ethically I agree with you and morally I agree with you. I think it is good to have a more equal society, especially in a society where some people were just born into a luckier house or a luckier situation and you know, I was afforded great parents who gave me great education, gave me an opportunity. I know other people aren't. Other people out there though, over it will be like, well, I don't care. So are there actual other benefits where it benefits that person? It, does it lead to lower crime? Should it ultimately lead to lower taxation because there's less of a demand on the welfare state? Yeah, there's there's a lot of things to say about that. I would start with, let's just bring it back to Bitcoin for a second. So you're, you know, you're absolutely right that a lot of the culture of Bitcoin is this very much this kind of leave me alone libertarianism, which says, hey, you know, I've made it and I'm really proud of the fact that I got in early enough and I'm doing well with it and and just I don't want anyone to 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 mess with that. And I, I get that as a as a human instinct, but if that's your point of view, then you should be especially concerned that if you're right about Bitcoin, that if Bitcoin is what we all think it is, that it's going to grow over time relative to the US dollar and to other fiat currencies, that those who got in earlier, who, who, who've, been, who've been stacking sats, are going to uh, do better than those who have not, then there's going to be a lot of inequality generated by that. And the people who did not get in early, or who have not gotten in even now, the no-coiners, no so to speak, they're going to be even more resentful. We see that actually. You know, one of the things that's interesting politically, if you think about it here and also uh, in the U.S. and also around the country, uh, around the world, Bitcoin is out of the headlines because you know it, its price action has not been as interesting, and as a result, it's not politically in the headlines either. Right? There isn't as much work going on to you know whack down the Bitcoin community because. Bitcoin is, it has, has price has not been as has been as it has not been as newsworthy as it's been in the past, right? So, uh, if Bitcoin goes to four hundred thousand or a million or what have you, I think it's biology Srinivasan who calculated that at that point I can't remember the exact price point. I think it's two hundred thousand or four hundred thousand, where more there will be more Bitcoin yeah. billionaires in the world than fiat billionaires. Like that's a pretty big tipping point, right? If that actually does happen. You better believe the knives are going to be out for those Bitcoin billionaires, and um, and so if we don't have a public spiritedness about the way we build this ecosystem, then uh, there can be a lot of effort by governments, by people, to to blow up uh, the thing that uh, all of us have worked so hard to build. Uh, the kind of ideas that you were talking about there, the public spiritedness, it's very European, I, I think, is a little well, a little bit more European um, in the way of thinking and. Uh, I can't help but like, I can't help but keep coming back to this, thinking about this. Like when I made the film, the thing that really stood out to me, and 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 I wanted to come back to you and ask you about, is that you can do all this great work, Ovik, and you can make all this opportunity. But if we have poor monetary and fiscal policy coming from the government, and all these ge other geopolitical issues, is that actually destroying some of the work? That you've been working on. I'll give you an example. With the massive increase in energy prices in the UK, there were there were people getting energy bills. Like it could be a cafe or you know whatever business. I was listening to one interview on the radio as a, a company that um, uh, it was a cake business. They made pastries. They had to close down their uh, three or four. I think they had three or four cafes. They had to close those down, and they only now make uh, at a central bakery and they sell them on, on wholesale. But they had to close down all three businesses. So. How do you approach this now, knowing that everything else has happened that's essentially destroying the opportunity for small businesses? Yeah, that's a, a great, great way to uh, to ask the question. And the way I would put it is, it's really important to distinguish between the status quo policy environment, which some people call the market, and what an actual free market looks like. Uh, what we've seen particularly in economies that are stagnant or or in recession or declining is that there's a there's there people will blame the the market for that result and not understand how much government has rigged the system to create that result um, to give an example the, the financial bailouts in in 2008 right that uh, that that inspired in many ways uh, the Bitcoin uh, white paper that uh, that was an example of, in many ways, socializing the downside for the banks, uh, but letting them pr protect their own upside, right? And the Federal Reserve is doing the same thing. It used to be called the, the Greenspan put or the Bernanke put. And for those who don't follow options trading terminology, what that means is basically your downside was always protected because 
if the financial system uh, was starting to suffer, or the stock market was starting to go down, Bernanke or Greenspan would come in and flood the market with money to prop up the markets for you, the financial community. And that's not a free market system. That's the government stepping in and saying, we're going to make your dollars less valuable so that financial institutions can thrive and do better. That's not a fair system. It's not a fair system. It is, is it a system where they are trying to protect the rich? Or is it a system where they're trying to protect the economy and by virtue of that, the rich benefit? Well, that, that's, that's exactly the theory. You know, there's this old, uh, there was this old saying in the, in the mid-20th century, what's good for General Motors is good for America. And the idea was because General Motors was this titan of American industry, that if, if it, what, what the CEOs and the executives of General Motors wanted the government to do, the government should do because General Motors makes cars, uh, General Motors employs tens of thousands of people, and uh, the economy of the U.S. will benefit from all the things that General Motors does to be the engine of the economy, literally and figuratively. So, uh, but that theory, I think, turns out to be very flawed in that uh, when, you, when you focus on what's in the interests of an individual business, I think 70, 80 years ago, it may have been different, a little different in that I think there was still that sense of from corporate America, well, we really have to do think, of, we really have to think about the national interest. We can't just think about our own narrow self-interest. That happened too. But I think there was very much a culture in the U.S. of, hey, you got, because it was just after World War II, there was very much this sense of solidarity. Uh, there was this sense of, hey, we've got to do what's in the American interest, not just in our own interest. The corporate world today is, is, is much more out for itself. Each company is out for itself in a way that I think was less true 70 years ago, 75 years ago. And as a result, uh, there is not this, this idea that what's good for a particular business or a particular industry being good for the rest of society isn't necessarily true. It might be that, uh, uh, or you have to make a distinction, right? The distinction is this incumbent player, uh, the big oil company, say, or the big bank, may have a certain interest, and that interest may be different from what the disruptive innovator in that sector wants, right? But the, the entrepreneurs, the disruptors don't have lobbyists. They don't have time. When you're building a new business, you're just busy trying to keep the lights on. You don't have time to hire lobbyists to tell senators what to do. You're just hoping that you can make payroll the next month, right? Whereas if you're a BP or you're Deutsche Bank or JP Morgan, you've got armies of these lobbyists who have built decades of relationships with legislators and they're you know, saying, oh yeah, you should do this, you should do that. So there's a competitive advantage to being an established incumbent that often uh, ends up steering people in the wrong direction. I'll, I'll give you some examples. So um, uh, several years ago, we had a situation where the big banks basically, because everyone knew they'd get bailed out if they failed, could borrow money at lower rates than smaller banks. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that means smaller banks basically can't offer competitive mortgages or competitive car loans because JP Morgan, say, or Bank of America can offer at lower interest rates because they're bigger, because everyone knows they'll get bailed out by the government. Now, if you try to reform that system, uh, those lobbyists from JP Morgan and Bank of America will say, gosh, you can't, um, you can't regulate us in that way. If we have to charge higher interests for home loans and, and car loans, then, then we won't be able to offer mortgages to people. People won't buy cars, and that'll crash the economy. You can't do that. Right, and it's this very similar thing. What's good for Bank of America is good for America. That was that's the argument, and you have to be pretty sophisticated as a senator to know that that is a self-interested and flawed argument. And that's where guys like me come in, or our, our organization comes in, where we we try to brief these senators, we try to brief members of Congress or regulators or people in the White House, and say, hey. Here are some of the things that Bank of America is not explaining when they say what they're saying. Well, we've had it this um, this past couple of weeks in the UK. How much did they unleash to protect the pension industry? I'm going to say it was 90, but I, let me, I'll have a look. I don't know if you followed this, but the, um, uh, the cent no, not the central bank, the government announced they were going to be buying up uh, UK treasuries. I think it was UK treasuries. Um, I, I didn't follow the story closely. 61 billion. 61 billion, yeah, yeah 61 billion. Uh, and it, it, that was buying UK treasuries, right? Yeah, gilts, but yeah, same gilts, thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. What really stood out to me there is like, I, I'm, um, I've am i been actively working on a program to try and help improve uh, opportunity for people playing football in my local community. You know I'm involved in football. One of the big problems, well, we have two big problems. Kids whose parents who do not have enough money can't send their kids to play football because they can't literally afford the boots. Right. 
or they can't afford the kit because to join a team, it's about £150 that gets you a kit and equipment that pays for everything. The second problem is the number of playing pitches that are available. They just don't exist. And this is a problem which has uh, been going on for years in the UK. We used to have youth clubs, they all got sold off. You know, playing fields have been sold off. Parks, have been, it's just all been sold off. We have less and less uh, outdoor playing areas for kids to go out and do sports and whatever, which we know is good for kids. It keeps them out of the house, it keeps them active. It just doesn't exist, and there's no money for it. Then suddenly, all of a sudden, $60 billion is immediately available to protect the pension industry because uh, the what, what was came out of the news was if they hadn't have done that, uh, a number of the funds would have blown up. Yeah, I mean, there was. I think the bond market basically went no bid in the UK, which is like would be catastrophic. Like there was a London banker, I saw in Financial Times, said it. We thought it was like a Lehman Brothers moment. What I don't understand is, is what causes are these funds taking too big a risk, or are they taking the right amount of risk, but the policy that's coming from government has essentially destroyed the market. I, you might know better than me. I, I have no idea. Well, I haven't followed this specific story closely, yeah. but I can tell you that in uh, in general, the pattern that you see, which it sounds like this story uh, fits into, is it's a combination. So the government may incentivize you to take greater risks than you might otherwise take. Eventually, those risks uh get called or you you blow up or you run into potholes and then you you get the bailout there there's a you know this is kind of what happened this is kind of what's happening now but it's also what happened in the financial crisis so for example when you keep interest rates near zero and with pension funds this is particularly a problem because i don't know how it works in the uk specifically but in the us there's a conventional rule it's not a law per se but it's kind of a uh, custom that that pension funds have what's what's called a 60-40 rule. They keep 60% of their portfolio in bonds and 40% of their portfolio in stocks. And that's basically all they can hold. Now, the problem with that is if you keep interest rates near zero, as the US and Europe have done for the last several years, you're getting no returns off your bond portfolio if you have traditional conservative bonds like treasury bonds or gilts or government uh, debt, right? You're getting no return on that. The stock market part of your portfolio might be doing well, but you're getting no return on your bonds. Now, if you compare that to the stock market or to inflation even, that might not keep up, right? So let's say you're generating 8% returns or 10% returns on your stock portfolio, and you're generating 0% returns on your bond portfolio, and that's 60% of your portfolio, right? If it's 10% on the stocks and and 0% on the bonds, you're you're basically generating a 4% return. Now, if inflation is 9%, that means your real return for your pension is actually negative, right? Your, your, your pension is growing at a smaller rate than inflation, which means that your savings are actually melting over time, as we often talk about in the Bitcoin context. This is even true in a fiat context when it comes to pension funds. So what do the pension funds do in response to that? They start investing in higher risk debt securities. So instead of putting their money in gilts or treasury bonds, which are considered low risk uh, securities because the government rarely goes bankrupt. They'll put money in maybe bonds of startups or bonds like you know Michael Saylor's MicroStrategy bonds, which we, we may all think are great, but from a financial standpoint, they would be considered higher risk bonds because Bitcoin is volatile compared to the treasury bonds, right? So you invest in higher risk bonds, and then what if some of those companies that you're investing in go belly up? Then those bonds are worthless and your returns crash. That can happen. And then uh, you can't pay off the pensions of the people who you owe money to, uh, and then the pensioners get mad. And so it becomes a political problem because those pensioners start complaining. And then you have a bailout by the government to deal with that. So the government incentivizes higher risk taking by forcing you into higher risk investments because that's the only way you can generate a return. And then some of those higher risk investments fail, and then the pensioners are left holding the bag. That's a sequence of events. Is one of the primary problems here is that we're not letting things fail that need to fail we're not letting it's almost like we're um it's almost like we're giving participation trophies to the financial sector because things need to break they need to fail we need if businesses are broken they need to fail and new better businesses need to be born out of their ashes is this is this the problem we've got to because you know you go and watch ray dalio's video video on you know the business cycles and we have boom bust and super booms but it seems like nobody wants to accept a bust anymore yeah, I mean, that's the conceit of uh, central banks 
is that we've figured out scientifically how to eliminate the boom bust cycle by uh, uh, raising and lowering interest rates. That's this kind of Keynesian classical 20th century thing that Fed economists, left or right, or whether they're nominated by Democrats or Republicans, let's put it that way, they basically, all the ones who are in, in office now, that's what they believe. They believe that the government has um, uh, access to the, the statistics, the knowledge, the data to dial up and dial down interest rates to finally fine tune the economy as if they're operating a machine. And um, that's not how the economy works for a lot of different reasons uh, we can get into. But that, that basically, that conceit is wrong. And the Fed has been wrong time and time and time again. Um, and they're always puzzled, like, well, all of our analysis from all these Harvard and MIT and Stanford PhDs said that we should do X and X didn't turn out to work. So that's very puzzling. And they never uh, stop to consider that their, their whole approach to thinking about the role of interest rates in the economy is wrong. And uh, we're a long way from fixing that problem uh, but we need to fix that problem. We need to fix a lot of problems, but but that's the that's the fundamental problem when it comes to the financial industry, right? Is that if 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 you have all these very well connected bankers telling you, gosh, you got you can't go too far or too fast in raising interest rates because then my business will collapse and the stock market collapse, and you'll get blamed for that, uh, Mr. Powell. Um, that's something they're very sensitive to because they all come out of that community and they, they often go back to that community after they're done serving in their roles uh, at the Fed. So that's their ecosystem. That, those are the people they're talking to every day. Those are the people they're going out to dinner with every evening. And so it's just, it's just a kind of a bubble culture that, uh, that's a huge problem that affects everyone. And I think one of the things that could improve that is for politicians to understand that. And the politicians have often been worse than the Fed, right? Because they don't want... Uh, a stock market crash when they're in charge. So they push the Fed to, or the central banks to, to lo lower interest rates so they can get through. Nixon did this in the 70s. He really aggressively pushed his Fed chairman to keep interest rates low. Uh, that's why they left the, the US dollar peg to gold because he didn't want a recession when he ran for reelection. And it worked. He got reelected in 1972. And then we had stagflation and the misery index and all the things that happened in the 1970s. And we're kind of going through that again. So the political cycle itself is uh, counterproductive to a, a setting policy that is right for society. They're setting policy which is right for retaining power. Yeah, now we're even going like from 10,000 feet to like 30,000 yeah. feet because there's this kind of macro bug, you could say, in democracy where the incentives of democracy are to look at the short term rather than the long term interest of society. And so... What, that's one thing that the founders of the United States thought about a lot. They yeah. thought about how do we how do we address that problem, and that's why they created all these checks and balances and tried to incentivize the election of politicians who would have a longer term perspective. But it's proven to be a challenge. So how does it get fixed? Because the I mean, there's so many problems over <laughs> the, on, on, in the UK at the moment. We you look around the world and there's lots of problems, lots of economic problems. This country's suffering from high inflation, some from high interest rates, you know, energy, uh, high energy costs. We seem to have them all at once in the UK at the moment. Yeah. It's not pretty to see. Uh, to just give you one example with regards to interest rates. I found out recently, every month in the UK, 300,000 people come off a fixed rate term to a variable rate. Now, interest rates have gone up so high recently um, and we've had such issues that, I mean, some of the mortgage companies have pulled their products. We had 40% of mortgage products pulled off, off the market. So there's less products available. The rates are higher because they're less competitive. Um, the average disposable income in the UK is £175. Now, couple that in with high inflation, high, high, high fuel costs. You've got people who now cannot afford, once their house flips to a variable rate, they will not be able to afford to pay their mortgage. Mm -hmm. And that's going to lead to a, you know, a large increase in the supply of houses which are available, which I think the government has recognized why they've reduced stamp duty. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, stamp duty is a tax you pay when you buy a house. But we've got that real issue with interest rates. It's a nightmare. But also, when I looked at the interest rates, when people are talking about 5 6%, it seems to me the problem is is the speed we've moved from one and a half two percent uh, rates at which people are borrowing to six seven percent. That seems to be the issue, because fundamentally, 
I actually don't think an interest rate of 5 6% is a bad thing. Firstly, if you've got savings, you've got an incentive to save because you can actually get a return in the bank, which we've not had for a long time. Right. And also, I don't think borrowing money should be so cheap. Right. So for me, the thing with interest rates is it's not the rate it is, it's the speed of movement. Yeah, and, and that's because the Fed and the central banks were late, right? They thought inflation in 2021 was transitory, transitory. and that's why they didn't have to raise rates. And then all of a sudden, when they realized it wasn't transitory, it was long-term, long-standing, they then the reversed course. Um, and, and that created this, uh, this more aggressive uh, increase of rates. Well, they should never have raised uh, drop rates so low in the first place. Then we would not have had to raise them in such an aggressive and, and rapid manner uh, in, in more recent months. So, so that's, again, it just points to the mismanagement of interest rates, which is, which is part of the problem. But, but uh, let's not leave the microeconomic element off the hook. So, you know, we talked on one of our previous uh, conversations and one of our previous conversations about how, you know, gas in, in Europe and the UK is so much more expensive than in the US. Now, even in the US, there's variation. I just, I was in California last week, uh, Gas there is like seven dollars a gallon, uh, and compared to three dollars a gallon in Texas. Now in Texas, three dollars is considered expensive, but the point is it's double in California than it, uh, the price that it is in the U.S. And that's not because somehow there's no way to transport gas to California. In fact, quite the opposite. Chevron is headquartered in California, at least for now. They're moving to Texas, but. Um, there's not. It's not like there's a lack of uh, of uh, of crude oil or gas or, or, or you know refined or whatever. It's all there. The supply is there. It's just that there's a there's massive gas tax in California at the state level that increases the price to consumers, and there is also a lot of restrictions in the permitting of production of gas, uh, gasoline, uh, in or crude oil in in uh, in California that thereby constricts the supply. So. Uh, that's not a problem in Texas, where obviously the energy uh, the energy industry is is much more influential, you could say, and and so uh, it has much more room to operate. But the end result has been more affordable gas prices at the pump, more affordable home utilities. And by the way, it's all it also makes it easier to to run industry here. If you're if you run a manufacturing plant and you're you're employing blue collar workers, you can do that more easily in a place where energy is less expensive. So the high price of energy in the UK is a choice that the UK does not have to make. make. And one of the things that the, the new prime minister, Liz Truss, is doing- Do you, When you say the high price of energy is a choice, are you referring to fuel gasoline or are you referring to like heating our homes? All of the, all of the above. So uh, we make energy more expensive by applying taxes to energy and, and restricting growth in the supply of low cost energy. So we do a lot of things to make energy more expensive. And part of the theory is, if we make it's a, it's a it's a kind of a climate thing. If we make energy more expensive, people will use it less, and that's not how it works. If nope. people if people you make more energy more expensive, people still need to have heat to heat their homes to 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 have refrigerators uh, to operate their air conditioners. So people will still consume energy. They'll just pay that extra price, which means their cost of living will increase and their disposable income will go down. So it's profoundly irresponsible. And this gets back to the free op lens. It's profoundly irresponsible to say that the way we need to address climate change and reduce carbon emissions is to make energy more expensive for poor and middle income people. Instead, what we've got to do is ramp up nuclear energy and some of these other avenues for producing abundant energy at a relatively low cost. That's the solution. And the good news is we're making progress with that, but that's sort of that's a 10 to 15 year uh, you know, timeline to fix the, the errors we've made. You know, you think about what Germany is doing has done over the last several years of shutting down its nuclear uh, plants post Fukushima, not just Germany, of course. Uh, and then everyone wakes up and says, "Well, wait a minute, you know, energy is really expensive now." I mean, a terrible policy mistake. And you have Gerhard Schroeder on the board of Gazprom. I mean, there's just a whole, you know, that's a whole other rabbit hole we can go down. But all this to say that high energy prices are a choice. High housing prices are a choice. You can build more housing. And I think one of the things that that I've read about uh, the new prime minister Liz Truss is that she's trying to part of her agenda is to do some regulatory reform, permitting reform that allows more energy production, more housing production. And by the way, if you allow more energy production and more housing production, then that generates economic growth because as people's costs go down, they can do more things, they can hire more people, they can spend more of their savings on other things so they'll actually have savings. 
Uh, and all those things were down to the benefit of the UK economy. So the UK has options. Europe has options. The US has options to, to drive their economy upwards. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, the former president, President Trump, did in the US, whatever your opinions of him, opinions of him are, he had a, a deregulatory agenda. That was a big part of his economic agenda. And each um, of his economic departments or, or agencies, executive agencies, had to come up with a plan of, okay, how are you going to reduce the regulatory burden that people in your jurisdiction are, are dealing with? Uh, and everyone had to work on that. And there were some real concrete victories as a result of that that led to, again, lower costs of delivering those goods and services, which means you can hire more people, you can grow your business, you can deliver products at a lower cost, you can innovate more, and all those things drive economic growth and prosperity upward. With the work you do with FreeUp, are you able to, or do you analyze how different states operate, uh, different, the, the policies they put in place, the different policies? Are you able to look at Texas versus California and, and see noticeable differences? We do. We look at we look at state differences. We also look at international differences. Uh, okay. You know, we've talked before about the World Index of Healthcare Innovation, yep. for example, where we've looked at the UK healthcare system for the US versus other countries. We've got a new edition of that coming out uh, in a few months, uh, and and that so so we both look at international models as a way of saying, okay, what could the US at a national level do better that it's not that it could learn from other countries, and also at the state level, there's certainly a lot to observe about about um, how different states think about things. It also helps with proof of concept, right? If you've got a state that's enacted a reform that's working, you can say, okay, this is a real world model that, uh, that other states can learn from. So there's, there's stuff like that that goes on. The, the climate and energy stuff is a particular nut because um, you know, there's two kinds of environmentalism, at least what we've observed. Because you know, we came into the, the, the climate and energy debate saying, hey, as, as we've talked about, Let's have an energy policy that's less regressive, that harms poor people less, number one. And number two, if you really want to solve the problem of carbon emissions, CO2 emissions, nuclear energy is the clear scientific solution. We just published a big paper on this that's on our website on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S. and how since the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was established in 1974, almost 50 years ago, not a single new nuclear plant has been uh, permitted in the United States. Not a single one. You compare that to France, which gets 70% of its electricity from nuclear. Ontario is another place in Canada that has a lot of nuclear energy. We've just, just abandoned the field, even though we invented nuclear energy. Yeah, just to interject there, on France, so a couple of things I found out in recently that was quite interesting. So Ger I, did, I, I think I read that Germany's energy prices are going to go up soon because they are buying uh, a lot of their energy from France. Uh, and they've also decided to extend the, do you know about this? I think Neil has forwarded this to me, but uh, they've extended the, uh, uh, or delayed the final, I think it's two or three nuclear parts that were going to decommission. But anyway, they've been buying yeah. their energy from uh, France. And I found out that France has something like 64 nuclear plants. Oh, yeah. Which it's, firstly it's blew my mind. Yeah. But then secondly, something the, the problem they've got is 30, 30 of them, I think, are out of commission at the moment. There's issues with about 30 of them. So they've got a lot, but they've got a lot that are out of commission. Can you try and look that up? Yeah, I've just, they've got 56, but it, there is a lot of outages at the moment. I'll see if I can yeah. see them. And I wonder if that's because there's an increase in demand for the rest of Europe buying from them. But the, the real question I have is, what has France got right? And how do you feel about France being primarily a, a state-owned energy system. Right. Because again, that is not something certain people who listen to this show will like. Yep. But energy security for a, for a country feels highly relevant right now. Um, I was chatting to Danny about, you know, he, Danny lives in Australia. He's like, my energy prices haven't really changed. I mean, mine, mine have doubled. And at one point, they'd quadrupled. They've kind of come back a bit. But the, you know, mine have gone up massively. And is it beneficial for a country to have a... To have energy secured and provided by the state, is that a better thing we should be doing or should it be open to the free market? I, I think both ways can work as France has shown. Yeah. You know, leaving the ideology and philosophy side out of it, both, both approaches have worked. Um, you know, actually, if you, look, if you look at France's electricity prices, they're not that different from the US. They might actually be slightly higher. The, there's a chart in, uh, it's the, the author of the nuclear energy paper at freeop.org is uh, Grant Dever. So take a look at that and you can see we have all the data there. So, and we actually talk about this specific thing that um, uh, that the France approach is very much, you know, the central government uh, runs it all. Uh, and in Ontario, it's been a little bit uh, more decentralized in that it's the Ontario government, not the Canadian federal government that, that's involved. And, and there's going to be a certain amount of government regulation nuclear regardless, 
even though uh, there are entrepreneurs who are developing new uh, small modular reactors and some other interesting technologies that basically build off the nuclear engines that are used in, in submarines, nuclear submarines, uh, to, to power individual buildings or neighborhoods or things like that. So there's a lot going on in nuclear. The advantage of having a scaled up nuclear program, whichever way you do it, is that you can build uh, you can, there are economies of scale. Once you've built one nuclear plant, you can just replicate the blueprints and build another and another and another. And that's especially true of the small uh, modular plants where you can basically use these kind of off-the-shelf parts to build uh, to build the nuclear power assemblies. And that... IKEA nuclear plants. Yeah, I mean, well, this is what, this is what uh, Elon Musk has done with rockets, yeah. right? So, you know, he's built these rockets that are a quarter of the cost of the NASA rockets or the European Space Agency rockets. And they're just as effective, if not more so, because they use off-the-shelf parts for everything. And it's just uh, obviously a great triumph of private sector engineering that he's been able to do that. Now he's sending people into space. He's doing all this stuff that, that used to be only done by governments, right? So there is, an, there is a way to do that with nuclear energy that preserves, you know, some of the, you know, protects against some of the risks. Yeah, Danny um, just found this. Okay. More than half of France's 56 reactors have been shut in recent months. The shutdowns have weighed on electricity supply across Europe and pushed prices higher just as... Yeah. It's, it's unusual that just at that time, and I wonder if it's because there's been so much demand for Europe that that's pressured, put too much pressure on the system. Possibly. It says here yeah. it was for maintenance and corrosion problems. Maintenance uh -huh. and corrosion problems. Yeah, that's. I think I, I do remember reading that somewhere. Yeah, so that's... That's something they can handle, right? I mean, or yeah. it's something that they should have uh, done a better job of handling in the past. But, but that also goes to this point about the mm. small modular reactors versus the big plants, right? So if you have smaller uh, reactors, it's a, if, you, if you take one offline, it's not a big deal. They're replaceable effectively. Uh, and so having a more resilient system is, is part of the goal, I think, if you really want to have uh, uh, effective nuclear energy. But, but going back to the early, yeah, earlier sorry. point that, that, you know, what I've observed going you know, working on this problem is like, there's an obvious solution. If, if you really want to reduce the, uh, the carbon emissions from our energy grid, but also ensure that lower and middle income people can afford the energy they need, there's a way to do that using nuclear. It's pretty straightforward. This is not actually something that's really debated seriously among people who understand the data. But yet you have all these people who call themselves environmentalists, who call themselves people who are concerned about the climate and the planet, who don't, who oppose the use of nuclear energy uh, to, to solve this problem because they're, a, they're, they're, they're effectively kind of aesthetic environmentalists where it's like, well, they like wind and solar because it just feels like you're out in nature and it's, there's sunshine and there's wind and it's, that's, that's, that sounds very organic and natural as opposed to if your goal is to solve the problem of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, potentially uh, increasing global temperatures, that's a specific scientific and engineering problem that nuclear energy solves. So um, the good news is we, with technology we've had for 75 years, we can solve these problems. We don't have to invent anything new to massively reduce the amount of carbon emissions in the United States and in a lot of other countries that now rely on coal generated electricity. What was that? that uh Nuclear technology, that guy emailed us about the other day. I don't know which I one you mean. Is that the micro reactors, the Oklo stuff? Or was oh, that something different? No, it's something different. It was the, um, hmm, trying to, uh, I copied you in on it. It was a different type of nuclear energy produced with oh, ther thermoid. Ther uh, There's right, geothermal, which no, is not nuclear. It's not geothermal. There's like, um, anyway, we'll have to dig that out. Okay, so I, I don't feel we fully kind of. Thor thorium. Thorium. Nuclear thorium reactors. Yeah. Okay, so just using a different isotope. Yeah. Sounds like, okay. Um, so I don't think we fully finished off, though, actually dealing with the issues caused by the central banks and the government. Yeah, okay. What is the solution? I know that's a big yeah. obvious question, right, but right. like, if you were advising, if you were advising on policy, what do these people need, be, need to be doing? Well, the, the, the solution is Bitcoin, but obviously uh, that's not, if you just say that in, in capital, on Capitol Hill, they're going to just kind of, you know, uh, roll their eyes and kick you out of the meeting. Have you mentioned it? <laughs> uh, we we have well the way we approach it in a more sort of like you bring them along kind of way, right? So how do you bring them along? Um, first, you highlight the problem of low interest rates and how it's contributed to inflation, right? So that's step number one: is to kind of explain to people that the Fed has not gotten it right. That the Fed has kept interest rates too long, too low for too long. In other environments, the Federal uh, the Federal Reserve increases interest rates too too high. It's like the Fed is not 
is is flying blind uh, and and not uh, making decisions. It's not this kind of, you know, the impression that you might have of the Fed as this group of super geniuses who have it all figured out. It's not true. So I think just punch, puncturing that veil is step number one in getting people to think about a different system. So once you puncture that veil. Then the question is, what is a better system than what the Fed is doing? How how do we think more rigorously about interest rates as it's related to the whole financial system? And then you start to explain to people, you want to look at housing prices, you want to look at uh, at energy prices, some of these other things. So we we published a paper recently on housing policy that's also up on our website. I think that's the most recent one, where um, uh, we walked through actually a simple chart that we put at the top of the paper. It compares. Uh, median household income after taxes to the median home price in the United States and just charts that over, I think a 75 year period, something like that. And there's this massive collapse. Ah, uh, there it is, he found it. So look at that, you see like that, the, that thick blue line, right? So it's looking, okay, that's looking at the last 40 years, sorry, from 1985 to 2020, uh, 2022. And you can see that, you know, for a good chunk of time there from like 1990 to, to 2010 or so, it was about you know 32%, meaning uh, the median household income after taxes was about a third of the median home price. And then it just collapsed in uh, 2012 or so. Why is that? It's because interest rates, as they were shut down, shut to zero after, uh, after uh, the financial crisis, basically led to a massive speculative bubble in the price of homes. And as a result, uh, your average median income did not keep up with that. So the, the amount of money that you earned as a percentage of the median home price declined, not because your income declined, but because home prices skyrocketed so much, the denominator skyrocketed. Hold on, but it went up from 2005 to, to 2010. Is that big jump around 2008, the financial crisis? Yeah, so it's basically, um, you know, you had a growth in income throughout yeah. that period that, that sort of kept pace with or even increased relative to median home prices. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there was kind of a speculative bubble going into the financial crisis driven by a bunch of factors. And then- um, That's here, right? That's right, that's right there. That's like, so that's the financial crisis right there. So there's, the ratio goes up for a bit because people's incomes were going up alongside housing prices. And then there was a collapse. So. The collapse, of course, that shaded area is when the recession was during the financial mm. crisis, that, that gray or that pink bar on your screen. But basically what you're seeing is after a couple of years, home prices started to really skyrocket as a result of the Fed's intervention in the economy. And that meant that even if your income was staying roughly the same, it was harder and harder for you to afford a place to live. Was it anything to do with the? So a lower number is bad on this chart from your own, from your standpoint as a as a, an earner, a wage earner, and, and a higher number is good. Is any of that um, to do with the the likes of Black Rocks or these big funds going out and buying up yeah, these houses? Absolutely. So it's all related. So why is Black Rock able? To, uh, to buy up all those homes. And, because they have a disproportionate access to cheap credit. Right, because they can borrow money at 0% interest rates. So this is one of the dogmas of the Fed that's completely wrong. So one of the theories that's widely um, ad- ad- believed uh, at the Fed is that when you lower interest rates, it creates a wealth effect. Because when you lower interest rates, it, cre- it, it increases access to credit for lower income people. They can borrow more and thereby... Um, you know, do do more things and 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 lift up their station. That's why, in general, it's progressives, people on the left, who favored loose monetary policy because they believe that well, if you reduce the cost of borrowing money, who needs to borrow money? Poor people, and this will help poor people by allowing them to borrow money. That's not how it works in reality. In reality, the way it works is poor people have low credit scores and don't have any net worth. And so banks don't lend them anything because they're like, you're never gonna pay me back, or at least there's a higher risk that you're not gonna pay me back. Whereas if I lend money to BlackRock, I know they're good for it. So- How much do you want? Take yeah, exactly, as much as you want. Exactly, we'll, we'll lend you as much as you want. Yeah. And so BlackRock can borrow $100 billion and, uh, and f- uh, flood the market, flood the housing market with that and buy up all these homes that are getting constructed. And then that's part of how the, uh, what the Fed does is it artificially juices the demand for housing by subsidizing it through low interest rates, through through easy credit. But the people who actually need to afford the homes, those people making $62,000, $63,000 a year, they're out of the market. They can't buy anything. 
And so what you've done is you've massively increased wealth inequality. You've massively increased the cost of living because those higher home prices filtered down to the high cost of rent, even if you aren't owning your own home. Yes, for the third of the population that owns its own home in the U.S., that's fine. Or, you know, that they can, they can, uh, they'll do better because their, their home value will increase. So their property taxes may go up as well, which is another uh, problem with all this. If you're retired and your home value goes up and your property taxes go up, you can't afford those property taxes, right? Because you're not making more money uh, to pay that property tax bill. So that that's something that creates, we talk about gentrification. Gentrification is driven by the fact that you have high property taxes in cities that if you're retired and you own your home, if you worked hard your whole life, you finally own your home, but you're retired so you're not making more money and your property tax bill keeps going up, you're forced to sell in order to, to live somewhere that's lower cost. I've heard that's a big argument uh, or, or a criticism of what's happened here in Austin. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, so in, in Texas, property taxes are pretty high in general because uh, we don't have an income tax, we don't have a capital gains tax, and property taxes are determined at the local level. And so that does happen. So as the real estate values in Austin have, uh, have, have surged in, in part, in large part because of the Fed, uh, if you've owned your home for a long time, yes, you might be happy that your home value has gone up, but at the same time, your property taxes have gone up well as well. And that home value, you can't dine out on that, right? I mean, that home value is, it's paper, it's a paper gain, uh, whereas your property tax, you're paying, uh, you're paying every year. So um, that can be a problem. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, in, every two years when this Texas legislature meets, they the property taxes are a, are a hot topic for that very reason. But all that to say that, the cost of housing in particular. So if you actually look at what is it that people spend money on in, in a given month, housing is the number one line item. A housing for the average person in the US is about a third of their uh, living expenditures. That is actually when you calculate the consumer price index, about a third of it is housing costs. Now, it's actually higher if you're low income for the obvious reason that if you're, mm -hmm. if you're lower income, housing is just gonna be a higher proportion of, of, your, of your cost of living, whereas, uh, for wealthy people, it's slightly less, but still, you know, housing is number one, and and so when the Federal Reserve drives up the price of housing for the people who are either first-time home buyers or renters or retirees who pay property taxes, they all get hurt by this policy, and it's just it's just one of these things where there's this massive gap between the Fed's point of view and reality. Why though? Like if everyone else can see it, if you can see it, everybody I know can see it. Why do they get it so wrong? I'm working on a book about this topic, which is uh, the working title of yes. which is, is Why Experts Fail. <gasps> what, when, when would this be done? Well, I'm still working on the proposal, so I'm still, it's, it's early, early days, early innings. But, uh, but the whole idea is to walk through all these different phenomena as to why experts fail at, by their own standards. So it would be very easy to write a book that just says, you know, the salt of the earth people are right and those pointy-headed nerds are wrong who, who, who work at the Fed. It's, it's more, uh, why is it that experts think they're awesome? Experts think they're awesome because they know more, they've studied more, they've, they've, they, they have more access to a broader range of information than you as an average person have. So, and they've seen a lot, they've studied the history of something a lot more than you have. And that's why they are experts and that's why they know more and should be entitled to make these decisions for us. Uh, but there are a lot of problems with that theory, one of which is, and this really applies to the Fed, is that historical data does not necessarily apply to the world of the future. So 75 years ago, the U.S. economy was largely a domestic economy. When General Motors made cars, they generally sold them to Americans. Uh, when American steel manufacturers like Bessemer made steel, they sold it to Americans, to actually to GM to build their cars. So there was a domestic market that the Fed could say, okay, if we increase the price of the dollar or, or you know, increase the price of interest, uh, uh, we can affect this, this kind of contained siloed economy. In a global economy where trade is, 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 is worldwide and 24-7, that doesn't apply in the same way. Uh, and so you can uh, do a lot of things to try to stimulate the local economy, the domestic economy, that don't necessarily work in the same way when you talk about the international context. And, and so the, that's an example of something the Fed just doesn't understand. Uh, and, and so the fact that financial markets are global, it's not something that the, the Fed understands that in theory. Oh, it's like, yeah, I know the financial markets are global, but when they look at historical data, they're not taking that into account. So that's one example of a way in which experts fail is that experts are really good at studying the past, 
That's often how they become experts. But the past does not necessarily predict the future. And where experts often go wrong is by applying historical knowledge to some a, a, a contemporary or future event in which the circumstances or context is very different. It's kind of arrogant, really. There isn't. There is certainly a, a component of arrogance uh, to it. Or I mean, I, I, and again, I, I try to um, uh, step away from that kind of terminology in the sense that the, the por- purpose of this book is, or the goal of this book is, to really explain to experts themselves why they should have more humility. But they won't read it because they're an expert. <laughs> well, well, hopefully they will. I mean, my goal with this book is is to to, to have that to, to tell an expert audience in a sense, hey guys, check yourselves. Realize that you might there might be something you're missing. You may not have complete command of of the context and the information as you think you do. I mean, COVID is obviously a great example that that's kind yeah. of what motivated me uh, to to think of this topic for for a book. And and so for those of you who follow my work on COVID, you'll know you'll know what I'm talking about here. Um, but but there's a broad range of, of areas of life, of public policy, where expertise, not only, it used to be experts were about giving you advice, and you could choose to take the advice or not. But increasingly, we've evolved into a society where experts have real, they have the force of the government behind their yep. opinions. And so it's especially important in those contexts that experts have more humility about the opinions they they issue and the rules they impose on society. Because as we've seen with COVID, particularly in the context of school closures, those uh, expert opinions can be incredibly damaging with a lot of long-term effects. And another example of that is fiscal policy, right? So we, we shut down the economy because of COVID expert opinion. Then we said, oh, well, we've got, to, we've got to stimulate the economy by spending all this money we don't have to compensate the businesses and the people who had their livelihoods taken away. And, oh, boy, now we have a massive uh, a, a budget deficit, and now we've, we've had these low interest rates that we now have to, 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 to compensate for, and that creates all these economic ripple effects down the road. So a, a lot of this, you know, we were talking before about, you know, is this because, you know, uh, 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 politicians and, and government officials don't want banks to fail? They don't want anything to fail, right? It's not just banks. And that sort of panic and, and, and sort of lurching uh, around not letting things fail uh, or not taking risk, it's real risk aversion is really the problem. Because, right, if we'd had a, on COVID, there was real risk. COVID is a serious problem. Lots of people died because of COVID. Lots of people got seriously ill because of COVID. It's not something that was made up. But having said that, we overreacted at a time when we had evidence to indicate that we didn't need to overreact. We could have had a much more tailored response, a much more targeted response that maximally kept the economy open and society open to the degree that we could practically. And if we had done that, we wouldn't have had to lurch into this massive fiscal stimulus, this massive monetary stimulus that we're going to be paying for for generations. Well, because they were able to find ways for certain businesses to stay open as well. It was very kind of, yeah. They found a way that uh, food could be delivered or things could be delivered. So they found a way the likes of Amazon could stay open or McDonald's right. could stay open. And they had to have their own internal policies. But the, in the UK, they, they found a way for the Premier League to still play football and they had all this bunch. So they found a way for certain things. But it was very kind of uh, discriminatory in what, in what they did, which yeah. ultimately, again, like all of this stuff, it always seems to benefit those who le- need it the least. Mm-hmm. And it seems to destroy those who need it the most. I mean, one of the points I've got here, Ovik, the thing that really stood out when I was making this film that like really, really got to me is I ended up going to this uh, town called Harlow. It's one of the most 20 deprived towns in the UK. It's just outside of London. And I went there because there's a specific project I wanted to see. It's this building called Terminus House. It's an old disused office block right in the center. Now, Harlow has a housing problem, uh, specifically a social housing problem. So whatever people think about government providing support and whether their taxes should pay for it, um, I like the fact that if you're a single mother with two kids and you're homeless, they will find you a home. But there is a massive shortage in the supply of houses. Mm -hmm. And so they've converted this office block in the center to social housing. It is essentially a Western favela Mm -hmm. because it's this awful office block uh, which has been converted into flats, but it has it. Here we go. Look at this. So yeah. we went there. Looks like the headquarters for the Health and Human Services Department in the United States. It's. I mean, it's awful. So it's got this car park underneath, uh, and and what they've had, they've got a mix of you know, families, young families, single mums with children, but also people who've got clear uh, 
social issues right, themselves. Right. So it's, it's become a center of crime and yep. drug abuse. It, everything I tell you, you would have predicted. Yep. If somebody had come to you and said, hey, Ovik, we're thinking in the UK of turning this building here into social housing, you would have said, don't, for A, B, C, D. Yeah. But they've gone ahead and done it. But the reason, the thing that really stands out to me, not just the incompetence of making that decision, and, and that's not the only one, mm -hmm. there's lots of these. And, by the way, the people running them are making a fucking killing because the government sure. are paying them millions to run it. But the thing that really stood out to me is that we are a richer society. You know, GDP has grown to whatever level, you know, double, tripled over the last 10, 20 years, whatever it is. We are a richer society, but I can't help but in the UK notice a widening wealth gap and uh, an increase in poverty, increasing people in poverty, children in poverty. So somehow we've become a more productive, more successful society and then push more people out to the fringe. Yeah, we've got this massive increase of people using food banks, people who are having to make a choice between feeding their children or heating their homes. How have we got to this point as a productive society? Obviously, down to policy. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things we've done is we've increased the price or the cost of all these goods and services that people need to live their everyday life. And so if you make things more expensive, even if society is wealthy, those on the bottom end of the income distribution, people who are lower income, even if they have more money on paper, uh, they can afford fewer things. So that's, that's one problem. We've talked about that in the context of energy. We've talked about that in the context of housing. But part of what we've done, and your housing example really uh, brings us home, is we've concentrated poverty in a way that we never did before. So it used to be that uh, poor people, wealthy people lived in the same communities. And what we've done with, with social policy through saying, oh, we're going to take all the poor people, round them up, and stick them in a concrete high-rise building, is... Uh, we've we've damaged both, right? We've damaged the the old fabric of a community where you looked out for the people who are down on the luck, uh, down on their luck, who lived in your in your town in your neighborhood. They the things we used to do more of because they're not they're not in that community anymore. You live in a wealthy enclave or a middle class enclave where those people aren't around. And then in those uh, in those uh, in those uh, uh, concrete high rises where you have a lot more low income people living together. You have, you might have two percent of them. Even might be bad apples. They might be criminals. They might be drug users. That because they're bad apples, that social disorder spreads to the rest of the apartment building because they end up dominating um, the system in a way that if they're if they're engaging in violent criminal activity, uh, then everyone else is scared to leave their apartment. For example, another thing that it comes up is there's lack of social capital. Right. So there's uh, an economist at. I think he's at Harvard now. He goes back between Harvard and Stanford, named Raj Chetty, you may have heard of. Really terrific uh, economic researcher on social mobility. And one of the things that his work focuses on is this idea that if you are a low-income people who is in a neighborhood or has social relationships with people who are middle or high income, your chances of your, of your economic fortunes increasing and improving over time are much, much higher than if you're a, a low-income person who whose social network is other low-income people. And so by concentrating uh, and distilling poverty and putting all the poor people in the same uh, apartment building, you've actually made their likelihood of success much, much lower. So one solution to that that, that we've talked about in our, in our housing work is uh, we have this program in the U.S. called Section 8 Vouchers, where instead of saying we're going to put you in a public housing building, we're gonna give you a, a certain amount of cash effectively to rent an apartment wherever you would like with a participating landlord, of course. Um, and that program has some things that we can improve about it, but in general it works because then you can live in the same kind of neighborhood as everyone else. It's just that your rent check is subsidized by this extra voucher that you can use to pay your rent. And they can live next door? They can live next door. The way they do it in the UK is slightly different. So whenever you uh, a housing company is given approval to build a whole bunch of houses, they have to build a certain percentage of social houses. Is it 10 or 20%? I don't know the number, but that's right. Yeah. There, what, there are cities that do that here. But uh, the way they do it, they end up grouping those together. Mm -hmm. So say yeah. they were going to build 300 houses and yeah. they had to build 30 that were social housing, they would group those 30 together and, and put, them, put them in a separate area. And so what ends up happening is they end up becoming like a stigmatized group that's separated from everyone else. 
But what would make sense, it seems to me, is that that those houses would be spread and distributed evenly amongst the, the other group of houses. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I, I lived in a building like that when I lived in New York City. I lived in a 52-story high rise, and there was a uh, there was a certain percentage of the of the building that was reserved for these uh, low income qualifying individuals, and they had a separate entrance to the building. So they they took different elevators. You know, they went in from a different entrance, and you, so that <laughs> that's not a great system either, right? So a better system is to just say, hey, we'll give you, you know, depending on exactly where your income falls, inspector. Let's say it's two thousand bucks a month or, or whatever it is. Uh, and then you go find a, find a participating. We'll make it. We should make it easy for landlords to participate in the program. That's one thing where Section Eight has some problems. Is it's they put put so many hurdles in front of people who want to participate in the program that your options in using the voucher are a lot more limited than a, in a conventional right. private market. But having said that, if you fix that and improve that. That's a way to say, we're not gonna concentrate poverty. We're gonna let you live closer to your family, close to where your job might be. And thereby, like that housing project might be far from where you have to work every day. So yes, you may have subsidized housing, but if you have to spend an hour going back and forth to your job every day, that's two hours of your day that your productivity is zero, right? So that's not good either. So having the system of, of it's a very 1960s approach to say, oh, we're just gonna build a big concrete building and, and stick you in it. Yeah. All right, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about before we let you go today as well. Um, one thing that uh, stood out to me today was the, the United Nations asking central banks to uh, stop raising interest rates. Um, the pound in the UK has dropped heavily uh, against the dollar, and that causes a number of issues itself. But I saw a chart, I think it was Preston Pish who put out, it said the US dollar versus all these other currencies. It seems globally everyone is kind of fleeing to the dollar, and, and currencies are crashing everywhere. So my first question is a double question. What is what is the uh, negative effects globally of a of a high dollar, but also that therefore are there some negative effects for the U.S. as well? And what do you think about the U.N. essentially meddling in policy? Well, just just to the level set for our, for our audience. So. Um, the reason why uh, how all this is related is that when you raise interest rates in your country, you make that currency more attractive because you, if you buy treasury bonds, if the interest rate on treasury bonds goes up and then you buy treasury bonds and in, in essence lending money to the U.S. government, you're getting a better interest rate on that. That makes the U.S. dollar more attractive because those transactions are happening in U.S. dollars. And so that's why the U.S. dollar has appreciated relative to other countries, because the U.S. has been more aggressive than other countries in increasing its interest rates to deal with inflation. So that's a good thing overall. I mean, there we can, as we've done, we, we can criticize the Fed for its execution, but uh, better late than never to, to, to the solution of, of higher interest rates. So that part is at least good. Um, but to your point, as a result, uh, you know, countries that um, – export to the United States, which is a lot of the world, um, the cost of their goods and, and services that they're exporting to the United States have gotten more expensive and that uh, that harms their economies, if you're an export-oriented economy in particular. If you're a, a t-shirt maker in Bangladesh, say, and your, uh, your t-shirts are now more expensive, um, uh, uh, well, actually, I, I have that completely reversed. Actually, when the dollar is... is, is, is uh, is more expensive. It actually works the other way. Yeah. Excuse me. Pardon me. So they, it's yeah, actually U.S. Everyone, exports, or that U.S. Yeah. US exporters are, are the ones who complain because uh, the their goods and services become more expensive to the rest of the world, and so that may be the thing that these these um, these other countries are complaining about. Actually, their exports become cheaper, which is good for their economies in general. But if they have to buy goods and services from the U.S. Uh, they become more expensive. Now, another problem that's that's, that's sort of a, a second layer problem is there are a number of countries, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, that actually have their currencies pegged to the U.S. dollar. And those countries, they basically have outsourced their monetary policy to the U.S. And so when the dollar becomes more expensive, their exporters have a problem because all of a sudden, they, you know, they're transacting in dollars as well. So that, uh, I'm not sure exactly who in the U.N. has been pushing the U.N. to take this position. If it's a dollar to nominated countries, it's pretty easy to explain because uh, they're the ones who are basically having to see their exports. But there's not many of them. There's not many of those. So that wouldn't, that, that, it could be the reason, but. Can you take the article out? Yeah. Um, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Let's just uh, essentially read in. Uh, there is time to step back yeah, from the edge of recession. Oh, so it's, it's just a, it's a it's more about the the broader GDP growth, the recession piece, right? Yeah. yeah. So like, if just, you have, I'm just going to read this yeah, for the audience. Please. We have the tools to calm inflation and support all vulnerable groups. 
but the current course of action is hurting the most vulnerable, especially in developing countries, and risks tipping the world into a global recession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it, so it's their concern is then that if the if the there's an overall recession because interest rates go up, then that does that harms all economies, including you know uh, uh, third world economies or however you want to describe it. But this is the Keynesian thing where you yeah. the idea you can't have recessions. You I I fundamentally believe yeah. you need recessions. Yeah. Oh, and, and, well, I. He, you're less likely to have recessions if you aren't meddling so much in the economy in the first place, right? But yeah. if you're going to try to fine tune everything and then you misread inflation because your data is wrong, and you, you, you if you inflation is far worse for everyone than a recession, uh, inflation is much much more damaging in the long term because, you know, uh, even if inflation is zero next year, we've still had had an increase in our prices of eighteen percent over the last two years. We discussed this last night, didn't we, Danny? Mm -hmm. This came up. What was it you questioned? Uh, it's not that I questioned it, but I watched a video of like some economists, like traditional economists, who were claiming that a sustained period of inflation is better than deflation. Yeah, th that's another one of these expert theories that uh, deflation is bad. Now think about it. Are you mad when um, your cell phone uh, or your smartphone gets cheaper? Are you no. mad when your laptop gets cheaper? Find that chart. You, you'll probably know this one. Go to Preston Pish's uh, Twitter. He put out this chart recently, which shows what, right. what what's going up in price, what's going down in price. And it was all electrical consumer goods that are all dropping in price. Right. And it's healthcare, education, yeah. uh, food stuff that's we, going we up in price. We have a chart like that. So maybe it's so, from you. So there's there's a there's a um, there's a couple of things to say about this. So here's the to give a credit to the argument. Here's why economists believe. Mainstream Keynesian economists believe that deflation is bad. It's because the way they look at it is if you're in a deflationary economy, it's because people are engaging in less economic activity. There's fewer jobs, there's fewer, fewer, you know, there's less job growth, there's less income growth, and as a result, people are buying fewer things, and that's why you're seeing deflation. So there can be a deflation in the context of a, yeah, this is a, this is a guy named Mark Perry who puts this particular chart together from AEI, the University of Michigan Flint. Do, so, do, do you know what really stood out to me on this? Yep. It is all the things that you need the most, that you have to have, and where the government has been the most involved in destroying the market. So yeah. if you think about healthcare, healthcare, the government heavily subsidizes in the US without regulating the price. And so the prices keep going up. College, we just did this trillion dollar bailout of higher ed where we're saying, okay, we're, you can borrow as much as you want and the taxpayer will pay it for you. And what are, what are universities going to do? They're going to raise their prices because they know that ultimately the taxpayer will pay the bill and not neither the university nor the student will pay the bill. It's incredibly destructive. So all those areas of life where the government said, we're just going to subsidize it, that's our brilliant solution to making things less expensive or to more affordable for you, you end up making things less affordable because those the, 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 the suppliers of those goods and services say, oh, you have a ten thousand uh, dollar subsidy to buy this. I'm just going to raise my prices by ten thousand dollars. That's how things work. So uh, that's been uh, incredibly damaging. Now, let's just step back. So there's two kinds of good. There's two kinds of deflation, and this is the thing that a lot of the economists miss. There's good deflation and there's bad deflation. There's a deflation that comes from a sick economy where you're engaging in less economic activity. You're you're buying fewer things because you're poorer. Um, that's that's the kind of deflation that people want to avoid. There's deflation that comes from competition and technological technological innovation, and from uh, uh, you know improvements over time in the quality and productivity of, of of businesses and of goods and services and of industries. That's good, right? The fact that your laptop can do more things at a lower price than it could before that's deflation too. But that's good deflation, right? And the problem with economists is they're stuck in this 20th century model where they're not thinking about technology at all, right? They're, and they're not thinking about global trade. So the two biggest drivers of lower prices in the US over the last 50, 60 years have been technological innovation, which drives costs down on lots of things, and trade, right? So you, the fact that you can buy things from somewhere else where they have a comparative advantage of purchasing it, or producing it makes it a lot less expensive for you to buy it. And so those are the two, two things that have, have, have counteracted the Fed. So the Fed has had this loose monetary policy, relatively speaking, for a long time. Uh, and they look, they look at these statistics with their, with their green eye shades and say, well, hey, inflation is low, so we can pump more money in the system. We're not causing inflation by pumping more money in the system. That's the way they think, because all they think about is inflation and interest rates as these two things that they can just manipulate 
at will. And that's not how it works. In reality, technology and trade are driving prices down, and that's good. That makes people's lives more affordable. And yep. this gets to this point about why free op exists, right? Why does free op exist? Because this observation, this point about how cost of living, the rising cost of living, is essential for social mobility and increasing social mobility. It's not just about income growth. If you only focus on income growth, but you ignore the cost of living growth that goes alongside it when you flood the market with money, you haven't solved anything, right? So when the Fed floods the market with money and says, oh, you're, this money is going to come to you eventually, trickle down effect, um, maybe it will to a degree, but if the cost of your housing goes up, you buy even more, you're poorer in the end, right? Whereas if we focus on those two problems together, how do we grow the economy so your wages can grow, so your earnings can grow, but most importantly, that your disposable income can grow because you're paying less in taxes, you're paying less in cost of living, then you create a wealthier society. So deflation in that sense is good. A stronger dollar is effectively a kind of deflation, right? Because the dollar can buy more things. That's good. But um, it needs to be understood in the context of uh, that's that microeconomic stuff where you're actually making the cost of living less expensive. You're not intervening with the Fed to artificially juice demand where uh, the long-term effects, it's like a sugar high. You create the sugar high, everyone's happy for a minute, and then uh, you crash. But do you think that becomes a problem with the dollar becoming, uh, well, are the currencies devaluing too high against the dollar? And do you think that will uh, lead to kind of another policy change to try and you know, reduce the value of the dollar? Well, I, I actually, it might it goes the other way right now in the sense that other countries have room to increase their rates, knowing that the U.S. is raising rates more aggressively. You right. know, usually the thing you worry about is competitive devaluation. It's called yeah. where countries will reduce their rates to keep their currencies low in price relative to the others, so that their exporters can be happy. Right? It's kind of this lobbyist thing. The exporters uh, talk to the government, and the government wants to do what the exporters want and forget about the average person who actually wants their currency to be strong so they can buy more things, so they have more purchasing power. So um, you know, there is risk of a global recession uh, from aggressive interest rates, but that ignores the fact that you know, we've artificially juiced the economy. The economic growth we've had has been juiced by easy money, not by actual organic economic growth where industries have grown and produced more things more efficiently, right? So, so that's the problem is you're going to have, there's always a recession if you've artificially juiced economic growth through, through low interest rates, through quantitative easing, through all these easy money policies. And that's basically the Pied Piper. It's like, you know, you, you eventually have to pay that price for what we've done. And so the UN can say, yes, uh, please keep interest rates low. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the good news is Jay Powell doesn't have that view. He, he understands that inflation is a real problem. By the way, I wish, Danny, that, that we were worried about, you know, if we were at a point where inflation was zero, then yes, we could worry, we could have a, a, a very interesting argument about deflation. You know, people had the same argument about interest rates. They said, well, you can never have a federal funds rate or a central bank interest rate below zero, because then that would create all these uh, crazy effects in the economy that we can't understand. Well, the European Central Bank did it. The Germany did it. They've had negative interest rates. It's not that hard. It just means you're you're paying people to spend money, paying people to borrow money. Yeah, right? I think that's Japan how you still do have negative interest rates. Right. So, so we can. You know, the, 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 there's this term you hear in in economic academic economic discussions and Fed Fed wonk discussions. Say, well, well, there's this zero bound. You can't cross the zero bound because then the world will end. It's like you're going through the black hole or something like that. No, you can go. You can charge negative interest rates. It just means you're paying people uh, to borrow money. Uh, and and you can do that if you want. It's destructive, but you can do it. We shouldn't do it. We should be okay. And this is, I think, one of the things you were asking before, how do we solve the problems or how do we address the errors of the Federal Reserve? One way to do it, and this is a big project, but one way to do it is to eliminate the stigma from negative inflation or deflation. That is to say, you know, yes, there's the bad kind of deflation, but there's a good kind of deflation that comes from uh, purchasing power going up and innovation and competition in the economy. The fact that you know, clothing is less expensive today than it was 50 years ago is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I think clothing was going up on that one, wasn't it? It wasn't. I, I thought did, it was one of the things that I went down. Going down. Back up. But I think that's the exact context of that uh, video I watched, missed. Um, and they need to read your future book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I gotta we, get cracking on it. Okay, before we let you go, you've always got your finger on the pulse on what's happening uh, policy-wise with regards to Bitcoin and stable coins and Crypto generally, even though I'm a Bitcoin show, is like, is there anything that's been going on that we need to be aware of? 
There are a number of bills uh, circulating in Congress right now that are relevant to the Bitcoin community. Um, the first is, um, I can't remember the exact title of the bill, but it's a, a bipartisan bill from Debbie Stabenow, a Democrat uh, from Michigan, a Senator um, uh, John Boozman from Arkansas is a Republican, uh, John Thune, who's the um, uh, the, uh, the the Senate Minority Whip, so one of the senior Republican leaders uh, in the Senate from North Dakota, or maybe it's South Dakota, South Dakota. Uh, he'll he'll kill me for getting that wrong. And then um, he's and a then, he's a regular listener. And, <laughs> and Cory Booker, who's a Democratic senator from New Jersey, who See people may remember who yeah. ran for president in in twenty twenty. Um, so the four of them put together this bill that basically would. It's a little bit like the Lummis uh, uh, Gillibrand bill, where it would define Bitcoin and also Ether as commodities that are explicitly regulated by the CFTC. But it's the only thing the bill does. Basically, all the bill does is says we're going to regulate Bitcoin and ETH and any any other uh, digital asset that can be defined as a commodity. As such, as a digital commodity, we're going to define what a digital commodity is and have that regulated by the CFTC. So it's a more of a standalone bill if you compare it to the Lummis bill, which is more uh, wide ranging and comprehensive. But uh, it has at least some chance of passing Congress. At least that's the uh, the indication I'm getting. From is, that, is that a good bill? Is it good to get away from Gensler and the SEC? Yeah, I think that's that's exactly uh, the one, Danny. You're putting it up on the screen now. The Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act. So the idea is that it would it would regulate the exchanges that trade these digital commodities. So if you were an, if you were a, you know the equivalent of a Coinbase or a Kraken, and you you sold uh, traded Bitcoin and ETH or any other digital commodities, not digital securities, but digital commodities. Those would be regulated by the CFTC under the same rules that apply to digital com- or uh, real world commodities today. And that would be again a way of uh, of advancing the ETF conversation, right? Because once yeah. you have a regulated entity uh, trading Bitcoin, then uh, it's a lot easier for the SEC to say, okay, you can have an ETF around this regulated uh, market. So that's that's why I think overall it's good. Is that if you actually have a, a a regulated market, a loosely regulated market for trading Bitcoin on exchanges? Of course, this does not affect a peer to peer trading of Bitcoin. Uh, then that allows there to be an ETF that broadens access to the underlying asset. And uh, I think that would be a pretty significant victory for Bitcoin. So that's something that we'll see if it gets through. But um, What's the time scale on that? The bill has been introduced in Congress, and there are conversations about intr- including it in a broader sort of uh, Congress every year at the end of the year, they have these deadlines where they have a lot of bills they have to pass just to keep the government operating. And so there's the goal of many uh, senators or some senators is to inc- include this uh, package in the broader package and thereby just clarify that, okay, now Bitcoin and ETH are regulated by the CFTC and thereby um, uh, there's some regulatory clarity around that. And that's why it's bipartisan. The Democrats like it because, okay, we're finally regulating this space. The Republicans like it because they say, okay, the regulatory clarity can uh, allow these businesses to to uh, proliferate and succeed. So that's an interesting opportunity. We'll see whether it goes anywhere. Another um, bill from some other senators or, or actually members of the House, excuse me, would is about um, is about stable coins, particularly algorithmic stable coins like Terra uh, Luna, um, that would uh, basically uh, effectively uh, put a lot of regulatory hurdles around the. Uh, around the existence of of algorithmic stable coins. So, and then there's the Federal Reserve, which is trying to just keeps looking at a CBDC, something we've talked about before. Uh, Central bank digital currencies is a huge threat to to economic freedom and and personal freedom. Fortunately, there I think we're 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 sort of stalled. The Fed is not really taking any concrete action to move the ball down the field good. on CBDC. So that's good news. Um, there are some efforts to try to fix this infrastructure bill thing that affected proof of uh, stake uh, and excuse me, proof Good of work. work. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure we'll get there, but that's another thing that's at, there are people who are working on that in Congress right now. So keep an eye out. You know, the thing I worry about with these end of year bills is a lot of things, a lot of times what happens, this happened to us before, where there's a last minute provision stuck in this thousand page bill that nobody reads. And that ends up being very harmful. Right. And so the the, the kind of crypto lobbies, Bitcoin lobbies in Washington were were kind of asleep at the wheel last time this happened, totally surprised, taken aback that this was happening. Hopefully this time around they're more activated, keeping a closer eye on the process. Awesome. All right. 
give a shout out to free up tell people where to go because uh look the work is brilliant i i, I genuinely love the email i'm not just saying it I, thank you, you every time i read it i always think oh, i want to talk to that person i need to talk to that person we need to get some other free up people on the yeah, show because i think the issues you cover are, are are very important um but yeah tell people where to find this all well uh if you if you're a twitter person you can find us at free up f-r-e-o-p-p and my personal twitter is a v i k just my first name and uh, the Substack newsletter is substack.freeop.org, F-R-E-O-P-P.org. All right, we will stick that in the show notes. Uh, sadly, we can't have dinner with you tonight, can we? No, I'm flying off to, to Norway this evening, but uh, look it. forward to doing it again. Well, listen, we'll always be back. We'll be back in January. I always like talking to you and like hanging out over. And uh, just keep doing the amazing work um, and anything we can do to ever support you, help you, uh, you just give us a shout. Same to you, Peter. I'm, I'm a huge admirer of what you do to, uh, to expand this community and make it more public spirited, as we said. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're done. Anything, Danny? No, that's good. We're good, man. All, All right. right, safe flight. Thank you.